Hill class. Um, so we're going to get started here. Before we get um, into the prayer and into the presentation, I would like to ask you all to please silence your cell phones. This um, will be recorded so we can present this um, on our YouTube page. So we're going to have Cassie smudge real quick, and then she's going to do the prayer. Tilhas tiki lamd kinchi kis kwa lam lam ya tu cook job is to quenchu poreka kwa kenach hawiam ulnis filam. Um so while we're waiting to get things started here, um so I'm just gonna talk about the events that we're hosting here um during Native American Heritage Month and then to talk about the tribe a little bit. So this is our second session for the Native American lecture series. We'll be ho hosting two more sessions um for the next two Wednesdays. So the following presentation will be um, Talia Timentall and Penelope Antum. They're going to be our next speakers, followed by Mel Tanaska, who's going to be our final presenter. We will also be having Rock Your Mocks Week, if you guys want to participate in that. It'll be November 14th that week. November uh, that week. So if you guys want to rock your mocks, and send pictures to us, that'd be great. We can post them on our webpage as well. We will also be having Red Shawl Day on November 17th. Also, the um, Native American fashion show that's going to be hosted at the Pasco Sherman Indian School. So um, I encourage you, you all to attend that as well. Um, that will start at 1 p.m. at Pasco Sherman. And so the fashion show is going to include four um, different types of lines. We're going to have a traditional wear line followed by the Unitary Apparel line um, created by Cody Miller, followed by Think Outside the Box by Brandon Pino and Megan Francis with her line. She's going to be um, having the students wear a jacket and ribbon shirt, shirt as well. Thank you, Camille. I guess give Camille a round of applause. Awesome. So welcome. I'm glad that all of you could make it today. Last week, we learned a lot about Skolowskin and Skolowskin um, historically and how he had an impact on his people and how he worked to minimize governmental influence on the tribe and continued fighting for his rights and his people. So this week, I wanted to invite a speaker um, to talk about how this fight is still carried on to today. So today, our tribe is still fighting against termination for Indian people and standing up for our rights. So recently, there was a big case that happened. Um, our speaker is running a little bit behind today. Um, we're still trying to locate him. But I invited two other individuals that were instrumental as part of the case. So first of all, I'd like to invite Cody Dizitel. Cody Dizitel is the executive director for the tribe. He's also a Sinaiks member. And he um, it was very engaged in this uh, trial. Good morning, everyone. So I will give you the, the short version of the history, but this the planning for this started back in 1998. So it, it literally took us a decade to put together what we thought the facts of a good case might be. And that took a lot of homework on our end because we were, we were being applied Canadian law, which is something none of us were very familiar with. So it ended up that Uncle Rick started hunting in the late 2000s, well, like 2008, 2009-ish, he was finally written a citation. I don't remember if it was 2010 or 2011. Uh, what I remember of it was that the, they cited him, pulled the citation because they weren't confident that was the best set of facts for the province to win on, issued a different set of citations later, and we ultimately ended up in court in 2014. So that was the British Columbia uh, District Court. Um, their court system is set up a little different up there. But after a lengthy trial, which we had a number of expert witnesses, both cultural people, people that understood Canadian law, people that had history of Sinaik's use and how they migrated from that area, whether that be because they were pushed by the federal government, pushed out by settlers, or just had to kind of reorganize communities because of losses to pandemics, that ultimately most of them ended up at Colville and some in the surrounding communities. Uh, again, after a lengthy trial, we waited another number of months for the, for the judge to issue a decision, and thankfully, she recognized that Uncle Rick had hunting rights as an aboriginal, or aboriginal person of Canada. So obviously, the, 
the province didn't agree with that decision, so they appealed it to the, well, I think it was the BC Supreme Court. Uh, the decision was upheld there for a similar set of facts. Uh, they kind of pivoted when they appealed it to the BC Court of Appeals uh, because they, I think, based on the wording in the judge's decision, didn't think like didn't think their argument was probably going to get them where they wanted to go. So they started to argue things like, were we a people of Canada since Uncle Rick was a U.S. resident? Um, there, there were some very good comments made when we went to the Canadian Supreme Court. Like, if he lived in Canada, would this be a different case? And their attorneys didn't have a very good answer for that. So ultimately, it was upheld there as well. And then on to the Canadian Supreme Court in 2020. And in a, in a fairly balanced court, I think there was about five liberal judges, four conservative judges as we would know them in the U.S., ended up with a 7-2 decision, which is a really strong decision in the Supreme Court if you're familiar with the court system at all. So with that, now we start the lengthy process of trying to figure out, now that we are recognized as an Aboriginal people of Canada, what happens to the extinction declaration that happened for what they called Lakes People in 1956? What does a Canadian-based government for Sinaiq's people look like? And what claims do they have for unceded territories? So just a little history on British Columbia. They, they had a treaty-making process very similar to what we had in the US. And they got to British Columbia and just kind of stopped. They have Treaty 8 that covers the northeast portion of the province. And the province is massive. But they, they just kind of started settling the rest of the province in the southern and western side, which is where all the people are, and just kind of move the, the tribes, or what they call First Nations, up there to reserves. And um, there, was a, there was a case, I think it was about 20 years ago, I think it was Delgamook, which probably doesn't matter to any of you, but anyways, the findings of the case were the tribes appealed a decision that the feds made, or the province made, and said those were unceded territories, they still had rights and claims to those areas, they should be consulted and they should have a part in the decision-making process. The Canadian courts agreed and the province kind of went, oh, oh, now what? And so since the relationship with First Nations in Canada is a government to government with the federal government, um, they're working through a process now they call truth and reconciliation. So they're trying to figure out how they get back to recognizing what tribal unceded rights are, what areas they have those rights in, and similar to treaty making in a modern day context, which, which is difficult, obviously, because I think treaty making was easier back then. People, they were negotiating treaties in the English language, which tribes didn't understand. Um, they didn't understand legal concepts back then as we know them today. And we have a lot of very educated, very experienced people, and we hire very experienced and super intelligent attorneys to help argue these things for us. So this is a complicated process that will likely take, oh boy, I would guess at least a couple decades. But um, I know that we've met on a very regular basis with the provincial government trying to figure out what implementation of that case looks like. And we're actually scheduled to go meet with the federal minister on November 21st. So in about a week and a half, we'll go back to Ottawa to see what federal recognition for Sinaik's people looks like. And, and since we were declared extinct, all of the other Indian Act bans up there are recognized under a piece of Canadian legislation called the Indian Act, which was passed in the late 1800s. It's a really horrible piece of legislation that kind of reflected what, what federal Indian policy looked like. And again, Canada was on par with the US, maybe even a little worse. So it essentially was an act that said, your tribes, we're going to move you here so we can make room for everybody else. And these are these limited rights that you'll retain. So that's obviously not a route we want to go. Um, since then, they've passed a Constitution Act, and most countries amend their constitutions on a fairly regular basis. So this is a fairly recent piece of legislation. I think it's only about 20 years old. So Section 35 identifies what rights First Nations people have under the Constitution Act, and that's the route we're trying to go. But this is a new process for the Canadian government, so they don't quite know how to do this. We're literally inventing the wheel as we go. So, I mean, this is... Although a hunting case, this was really the start of a lengthy process to show that First Nations, the Sinaiq's people specifically, still exist. They just may not exist in Canada. 
And we know there's Sinaik's descendants in Canada, too. They were just moved to one of the other adjacent First Nations. And so now we need to work through that process of redefining who those people are. So we'll have to establish a constitution. We'll have to establish a tribal government. We'll have to decide what membership looks like, which will be a hard thing to do. Um, most of that in the U.S. happened either under a piece of legislation we call the Indian Reorganization Act, which defined what tribes were, how they defined membership. And most or many tribes adopted that. And the ones that did not, many of them have constitutions that look very similar to the template the federal government gave us. So things like a quarter blood quantum, things like base rules, all of those things come from that piece of legislation. So um, again, there's similar things in Canada, although I don't think they have blood quantums. Theirs is based on descendancy, um, similar to what Cherokee or other tribes in the US would have. But all of those are conversations we'll have to have. How do we, how do we track lineage for Lake's descent? Is there a blood quantum associated with it? What does membership in one versus another look like? Because right now under our current enrollment code, you can only be enrolled in one tribe. So will people have to pick or will we have to do an amendment to our code and ensure that the constitution we pass on the Canadian side, if we need a constitution on the Canadian side, reflects that same flexibility. So a lot of unknowns. And since I got to run back up and get back on the board meeting, I will pass it off to the chairman to take it from there about his thoughts on where we go next. Well, I think Cody covered about most of it, but uh, I'll do what I can on stuff we're working on currently now, too. So I'm Jared Erickson, I'm the chairman for the Colville Confederated Tribes. Um, just last week, we had a meet up in Canada. We're trying to meet with all the different agencies up there, right? So it's establishing, not, all, not just trying to reestablish the government, but looking at all the different agencies you meet with. Like, so down here, we have B, BPA for the dam, right? They're the ones that manage the dam. So we're looking at up there is BC Hydro, and there's several dams up in Canada. There's... That's a whole process itself. We had a meeting with the Indigenous um, Relations, I believe is what they are, the Ministry of Indigenous Relations. That's what the meeting will be back um, for back east, and that's the work on getting our federal recognition again in Canada. There's a lot of unknowns, like Cody talked about, with reestablishing a government. Is you reestablishing a government is an extension of the government. You know, we always say we don't recognize the uh, the boundary, right, the 49th parallel. So how how does that look then? Is this an extension of our government up there? Is it new government? I think we have an idea, but we are we you know we haven't fully settled on that yet. Um, like Cody said, do we need a new constitution or do we not need a new constitution? How does it look? Um, there's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of going on with after our Supreme Court case. Um, a lot of these other tribes reaching out to us, right? Seeing how because they're all cross boundary tribes too. There's Mohawk. Um, oh, what are some of the other ones? I'm drawing a blank, but there a lot of them are reaching out to us as well. They have the Jay Treaty, but the Canada doesn't recognize the Jay Treaty, so it's only the U.S. that recognizes it. So we have a meeting with those groups of individuals. Uh, Roger Finley's been on that a lot and um, doing a lot in that regards. But it's it's a lot of unknowns. And it's just reestablishing a government is, is hard. And he talked about the base roles. You know, we've been working on if we establish a new base roles, where does that start? You know, how far to go back? We can trace a lot. But we've traced that back already quite a bit. They're still working on it. We've had meetings with ONA. Uh, we need to talk to Shushwap and Kootenai about their Sinaik's members that, you know, once uh, Sinaik's were declared extinct, they went to these other tribes, these other bands. And so we're looking at how do we incorporate everyone under a Sinaik's confederacy. So we, you know, also have that open. If they choose to leave, the, it's the same up there. They can only be enrolled in one tribe. So they can't be duly enrolled either. Um, so we're looking at that. How would that look? They, you know, come to us. And then us, do we have to establish a new, for, you know, I, I argue that we don't recognize that boundary. Right? I'm, 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 I'm Colville, Okanagan, and Sinaiks. I'm all cross-boundary tribes. So how do we look at it and not recognizing that boundary? Because we're always, we're, we're always stuck with Canadian and U.S. law. So it's, it's, it's a hard, hard thing to change. You're pretty, much, you're pretty much trying to change the whole concept of how the Canadian government thinks and looks at this. Like he talked about, we don't want to be under the Indian Act. It's had a lot of issues with that as well. Without like going in depth with it, it's hard to explain a lot. But, uh, and then the, the, what does it look like for our cross-boundary tribes? Is that dual citizenship? Even though we don't recognize the boundary, do we get dual citizenship, or how does that look? So there's a lot to it. Um, I wish I could have been more prepared to talk about this. We were in another meeting, and uh, I think Rick, I think Rick actually, I might have just saw him, but Rick Dizdell was supposed to be here. He can talk more about personal experience and what he went through with the case. He was instrumental in it. Yep, I do see him. So perfect timing. So uh, Cody covered a lot of it. There's, there's a lot more working on, but working with all these different agencies has been a uh, 
big hoop to jump through and then it's having those consultations it's a lot it's a it's every so pretty much every agency you meet with down here there's a similar agency up there ecology fish and wildlife ministry of forest and so having all those meetings set up to re establish that consultation process and what that looks like um and then they're, they're in a reconciliation process up there as well they're trying to so it's 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 a lot of work um but rick was instrumental in it i'm gonna let rick take over now that he's here because he's the guy that really made this all happen um with you know obviously with the help of the tribe but he's the one that uh saw this through so rick you want to come up <laughs> thank you all you're the man they're waiting for yeah why would that be Yeah, some it's a little bit on the icy side there. I'm sorry I got here. Should have planned ahead of time there. So. Um, where's Christy with uh, the suits are from the ceiling or, or from Cooley Dam? Omex, yeah. Different places like that there. And we got from grade what? Middle school to high school? Um, yes, uh, the questions of uh, what I did, what I'm going to do, uh, if there be any questions, I, I could probably open this up to somewhat question and answer period, if you would help me out here, because uh, I'm not as, I'm not as uh, fluent in conversation to some of my tribal council you know. yes can you talk about uh kind of what made you decide to go up there and hunt like personally what motivated you to do that uh personally motivated me um when somebody said that uh, that was my traditional territory um yeah um I've been up there hunting before uh, when the tribal council uh, thought it would be a good idea to go up there and go hunting. It was, uh, I, since I've been up there quite often and stuff like that there, uh, Mike Palmer was one of uh, the people that kind of suggested that I go. I was, I'm thinking, not to thinking bad about Mike Palmer or anything, but uh, he might want me to get arrested and probably stay up there forever. <laughs> <laughs> and anyhow, um, the motivation of me going up there and doing that there is uh, something that I did that I wanted to do that be at this side or be at that side. If I didn't do it, uh, I was probably going to just regret it the rest of my life. Okay, so um, in my heart, I knew I was right. I mean, uh, as I was going through the court case and, and I was talking to the lawyers and during the court case there, and they said, well, why did you come up here and go hunting? I said, well, this is my traditional hunting grounds. Um, I can remember my grandmother saying that her father would go up into that part of the country and get the winter's meat because this part of the country here was, uh, there was no brush. I mean, my grandmother said you could go any place with the horse and buggy because there wasn't no brush. It was just all just big timber. And uh, the brush and stuff was what the deer needed and most ungulates needed to survive. And so they would go farther up north uh, where it's a kind of a temperate climate up there. It's a inland rainforest, but um, that's where the game was. And they would go up there and get the winter's meat and then come back down here because this is... <laughs> This was the kind of the place that they stuck us all into. Uh, the part that uh, finally got me to go go do it was something that uh, I just wanted to take a jab at them. And I got some more stuff to do up there yet. I mean, I'm not finished up there yet. I got some more jabbing to do. So um, that part there... Uh, the family heritage of, that's my, my 
my shirt there. I got, I got the, the part there that uh, it's just like the family tradition. Uh, and that's what the lawyers would say. I said, yes, I, I hunted this country where my dad hunted, but I wanted to go back and hunt the country that my grandfather hunted. So that's what really motivated me to reach back up there and grab my roots in that area there. So that would be at that part there. Any other questions? I got one more question, and then I'll pass it. Can you tell us about the actual hunting, like the experience that you had? The actual, what happened? Hunt, the actual yeah. hunting, yes. Uh, boy, <sighs> there was a point in time when the tribal council thought it'd be a good idea for us to go up and go hunting, okay? And so they sent me and Steve Judd and Maureen Murphy up there in the Castle Guard area uh, about this time of the year uh, to see if it was feasible to go up there and go hunting. And so we went up there, and it was about middle of December, I guess, and uh, we <laughs> drove through the town of Castle Guard and going up towards Nelson and just below the airport there, there was a, a number of whitetails standing alongside the hillside there. And we thought, well, yeah, it would be pretty easy to, to harvest game here. And uh, we went back, and, and Steve and Maureen, they reported to the council about uh, we should go hunting up there. And it would be pretty easy to, to start a court case. And from that point in time there, the council kind of grabbed things and mulled them around and stuff and thought, well, it's pretty late in the year. And uh, we don't want it to be somewhat uh, look like we're out there murdering starving animals. So let's, let's hold off on that there. And so, as you know, the tribal council comes in new about every two years. Well, the next thing you know, it all felt the, the agenda changes and everything fell to the wayside. So two years go by and nothing happens with us going up in Canada and go hunting. And then a new council comes in. And it's, oh, we're going to Canada, let's go hunting again. All right, and then things are going along. And they're setting up some stuff like this here. And it kind of falls to the wayside again. And two more years pass by. And things come about. And the time progression, you see the line of two years, four years, six years. And then another council comes in, and they're favorable for going up there and go hunting. Uh, so they send a number of us guys up there with the ONA, and uh, we're going to go hunting up there. And I go with the ONA up there, up in the Rock Creek area, and I harvest a, a small bull elk and a, and a little spike buck. And we tell the game officers up there, come get me now. I've, I've harvested the animals. I'll wait for you here. And so we waited around, waited around for dang near four days and finally I says, oh, I got to get back, you know, down the States and they couldn't find me. So things just kind of fell to the side and another year passes. Whew. The things that happened through that there part there. Okay. Then we get another tribal council in and they're not so favorable with me going hunting up there. They're kind of arguing with the O and A back and forth, and things are things are not really too kosher. So on we we go through time, and you can see I I got a little bit grayer as time goes by, and things happen, and time progresses. Now we're about ten years into it, okay. And there's a favorable council, and they're all for me just to run up there and go shoot a deer or whatever and, and bring it right back. Um, the part uh, of a friend of mine who was director of Fish and Wildlife at that, that, that time says, if we're going to go into this year, we should go into it in kind of a, a more lucrative light and stuff. Let's go up there and let's have town meetings, tell them what we're going to do. Let's go in and talk to the conservation officers, tell them what we're going to do. Uh, Let's go through there and survey the area, see where the best place would be to hunt and whatnot so we're not har over harvesting and everything. We'll set up game regulations. We'll set up seasons and everything, the same as we have here on the reservation. And uh, that looked very good in the court case 
that proceeded after this here. Um, so as, as we, the favorable thing went by, I was fortunate enough to go up there and harvest an elk. And we called up the game officers and said, we got an elk down, come get us. And we waited for a day, and pretty soon we waited for two days. And we said, God, we got, we got to go, you know. And uh, just as was leaving, here come the game officers. Finally came there. Well, they give me a, uh, it's called a notice to appear citation. And we went on with that there. And so another year goes by, and nothing really happens. And so I'm thinking the statute of limitations of went, went by, this here, that, there. And so me and my wife and my daughter, we go up there, and we go hunting again. And we harvest another elk. And well, we go right down to the game office and turn ourselves in, thinking that this is, this is going to be it. And this is 2011, and uh, nothing's really coming. We waited another year. And it isn't until like 2012, like that there, that I get a call saying, you got a case. We're, they're going to they're gonna push you forward. I thought, well, this is great. You know? I said, what do I got to do now? I said, well, you got to go to the very lowest form of court, which is just there in Castle Guard, which is like the regional uh, type in there. And at that point in time there, make your plea. So we drive up to Castle Guard. We sit on these hard old benches. Well, we walk in there and we look at the docket right up there. And sure enough, here's my name right there on the docket. And so we're going through all these family disputes and drunken driving and stuff like that. He gets to my name, and they go right on through. And I go, wow, that's what happens. So after fashion, my wife says, well, go up there and ask the, that one prosecutor up there uh, what's going on with you know them skipping me. And so I go up and ask him. I says, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm this here and that there. I'm supposed to be, be uh, get a plea in today, not guilty or guilty. He says, wow, they skipped right over you, didn't they? I said, yeah. He said, well, what's your case? And I started to tell him what my case was. And after I tell him who I was and what I was trying to do this year, he grabs my hand and starts shaking my hands. and says, glad, I'm glad to see you. <laughs> I'm Mr. Wiley. I don't know why you're, you're so glad to see me. And he says, if it wasn't for your people, I wouldn't be here today. Because it's his grandfather that came up into that part of the country uh, when the gold rush was going on. And like any other gold rusher, he was just running up there with a pick and shovel, figuring to get rich really quick and, and be out of there, and got caught up there in the wintertime. And it was a Christian family that took him in during the wintertime and put him through the winter and let, let him, and he survived the winter, okay? And that's where his father and his fourth, fourth words, Mr. Wiley, came from. So he was just, and he heard my case, and I told him what I was trying to do. He says, you know, this case will go to the Supreme Court. I said, well, yeah. He says, but one thing, he says, by the time it gets there, you're going to be an old man. And I, it really came to pass that I did, in fact, to have, to have that there uh, to come to pass. Um, so I sat there, and they said, well, can you come back in a month? And we'll get this straightened out. So I go back down here. I go back up there in a month. And I get there and we're sitting on the bench and stuff is going on with all the domestic and drunken driving and stuff like that. And they get to my case and, and the clerk and everybody's on the phone and stuff. And they can't get a hold of my lawyer. Mark is somewhat, they got a telephone link with him, but the telephone link's not working. And so... They says, this is not going to work. Couldn't you come back next month? Okay. <laughs> so we take off. We come back up the next month. And then, for whatever reason, the prosecutor's not ready. <laughs> and they say, okay, come back next month. <laughs> That's the part that really kills you. After four months, I finally got up right there to stand the, where you do there. And look at the judge and say, not guilty. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> but that was the part there that uh, had to be, it's like taking the first step forward. 
And then from that part there, we start building the case, building the case, getting witnesses together. Um, that there part there. And then we went to Nelson. And this is just like the, the, the regional, next regional step of, of the court case. And that took a month of testimonies on both our side and their side. And to the part that um, after a month of deliberation from either side and something like that, the judge came out with her decision. And as is a very lengthy decision, and uh, the part there, uh, just letting her read it in open court, it, it just kind of got these ups. And like she says, oh, this is good. These guys, people are backing them. We're so happy. And then down here, well, Section 35 is, you know, that was done in 88, and that's not good. And then it goes back up and goes back up and down. And right to the end there, because like, uh, I think it's like a six-page report or uh, things that she puts out there. And uh, at the very end, uh, not guilty. <laughs> God, everybody goes, wow, not guilty. And we're, we, we won the case. We won the case. And everybody kind of goes great for a while there. But then they said they're probably going to appeal it. You know, um, One of the funnier things that happened as I walked out of the courtroom, uh, as I come out there, and all the reporters are there. How are you doing, Mr. How you got here? To, how what's your decision? How are you, how are you feeling like it? I'm really good at something, uh, you know, that I'm setting forth here, putting on an anchor. It's, it's good enough for uh, me, but I'm more thinking about my family and my future um, grandchildren and stuff like that there for, for their uh, sake and stuff like that there. Yeah. <laughs> Mikey Marshani standing next to me. Uh, you got to know the man. To, for whatever reason that, that I'm going to make this statement and stuff like that there. But I say, yeah, this is the chairman of the Tribal Business Council right here. This is Mike Marchand. And so they shovel on Mike. Mike Marchand. It, as easy as Mike Marchand is, he's standing there very sober like this here. And they're, Mr. Mr. Council, what's your next step right there? We're going for the land next. <laughs> <laughs> You, could, you see the mouths under but go. <laughs> so that was, that was, I just had to bring that up because that was so cool. <laughs> so that part there, we make it through that there. Uh, we w wait around for about six, seven months. And then we go to um, our first appeal. Well, I shouldn't say we go to our first appeal because the first appeal was one appeal judge looking over the trial judge's uh, decision. And in doing so, um, my lawyer said, I didn't really have to be there. And so that there judge, appeal judge, looked over the first trial judge's decision. And after about a month or so, he came back in favor of the trial judge's decision. Okay, that's one appeal judge plus a trial lawyer that, that are for my case. And then time goes on, six, seven months goes on, this here and that there. And then the provincial government uh, reviews and wants to appeal my case. So this means I have to go to Vancouver and uh, sit there for two days as they're making their cases and, and appeals and stuff like that there. And after fashion there, the, the three judges that are sitting in on that there, uh, Come in favor of my decision, and so on. I got the trial judge, first appeal judge, and then three other uh, trial judges, <laughs> appeal judges on my side there. Um, months and months and months and months and years seem like go by, and one day uh, we was all at the community center, and Mark Underhill calls up, and he makes a statement because we got all the kids and stuff there from the HLM school there. As he makes the announcement, he says, you ever been to Ottawa? And I said, no. He says, well, now we're going to Ottawa, the Supreme Court decision of Canada, which was great. We had people in the community there all over on the reservation making reservation flights and everything, heading for going to go to Ottawa. We was going to make this great stand on the courthouse steps there. What happens? 
Uh, pandemic, COVID-19 <laughs> struck us all down. We was all nobody could go. Appeals from the judges, from the lawyers, this here, that there. Um, different provisions were made for a few of us to go. Shelley Boyd and Derek and I uh, were allowed to go to Canada, but we had to sit around and, and quarantine for 14 days before we could get on the plane and go to Ottawa. We went to Ottawa. We landed there. It was a very chilly, cold, yes, uh, time of period, but they wouldn't let us in the courtroom. All they let us do is stand out on the courthouse steps. There. So we got my little sign and stuff saying we're not extinct. Shelly's dressed up in her native regalia and stuff like that there. And Derek, he's photographing it. And we're standing there going, hey, Kirk, what's wearing on? Yes. <laughs> to the point in time, my partner, Shelly, she's dressed in her native attire and stuff, and she just had her moccasins on, and she's going, <laughs> I got to go back. To <laughs> her feet were getting tremendously cold. But we had some native people there. They came in support of us. Uh, and stopped and, and said prayers with us and whatnot. This here and that there was uh, very humbling, I thought. And the fact that uh, we got to watch uh, some of the courtroom drama and stuff like that there through, through the videos and stuff. Uh, and the different people that were supporting me, the different tribes up there in Canada that were supporting my, my decision uh, was very humbling. Uh, the part that uh, there was all these different judges were making their uh, rulings and their decisions and stuff like that. And just hearing and asking the different judges that were asking our lawyers and their lawyers and stuff, different questions and stuff, you could just about pick out which one of those nine judges were definitely against me. And then some were for me. And after it was all said and done, out of those nine judges, I could see five that were pretty good. You know, and then there was a few of there that I thought were pretty skeptical. So I was nervous about the decision. Um, there was a um, favorable fact in the drama of all of this courtroom decisions making of the Supreme Court of Canada is that I had an appeal. If the appeal went against me from the Supreme Court, I could appeal the Supreme Court's decision to the Queen because the Queen is the one who uh, brung up the case against me. She's now, I wish I would kind of like lost the case and went over there and appealed my case to the Queen. <laughs> that would have been that would have been cool. Uh, but the fact that uh, we did win the case, this here, that there, um, the part that, like I said, that there's still some pokes I want to make at Canada in some different areas. Uh, there's so much up there in Canada, up in the northern part of the country up there, that we could influence the people there that I've been around, the people that I associate myself with. Robert knows that there. Uh, they really look for a native kind of a decision on which way we should we should we go, and there's times and stuff like that there that um, I get this feeling that uh, oh my god there there was a a commercial one time about a native guy in his fight against pollution, and I can't remember silver eyes silver chief something like that there. But uh, he was a, a, a very noted like, uh, actor and stuff like that there. And I see that scenario come in where these people come to me, come to Robert, come to different Native people up there and say, you know, how, how can we make this better? Uh, I tell you, yeah, <laughs> you could cut some of that brush down over there. You could uh, plant some trees over here. You know, you could put up a rock barrier along the river right here that could stop erosion, this here, that. And that's what uh, some of the people up there um, really look forward to as Native people, as more nature-type loving people than themselves, I guess. 
where I see Canadians as being very more, more nature loving than us sometimes. Uh, that would be a, uh, I'm getting, my, my rambling's getting on here and on, on. Yes. Questions? up there. What was that, what was that question again, son? Oh, yeah, I got that now. Yeah. I shot several deer up there. In fact, I shot uh, some game back in the 80s uh, when we were doing a road blockade in that area. Uh, there was a uh, tribal, I would call it, um, burial site that was, we figured, and I, it was desecrated, yes. Um, uh, but from that point in time there, uh, we was kind of getting low on supplies when Dan Coos Swan and I uh, decided to go up on the hill and harvest some game. And so we went up on the, up up the road a ways and we, we shot a little whitetail buck. And we brung it down. We hung it up there in camp. Well, the people, they came by, and they saw that hang. It wasn't hunting season for them, so they were really angry. And they come by, and they were pointing their fingers at us. Hey, we're going to shoot on the game. And uh, next thing you know, the conservation officers, they show up. But they don't come into camp. They park on the road on the outside. And uh, after fashion stuff, they kind of look at each other. You know, I don't want to go in there. There's a teepee set up there. I think. And they go on, but they never do say nothing to us about harvesting game at that time. And uh, that point in time there, the, the Section 35 when they, uh, in the 80s when they were just making up that rule on Native people and stuff like that there has uh, an effect on the Native people. My case is somewhat unique and is that I'm extinct. So <laughs> there was these long points of doing stuff up there. And everybody go, I didn't see that. I think he's extinct. Yeah. I don't know if we could charge him because he's extinct. I mean, is there some kind of clause you can come up with extinction? I mean, I was shooting dinosaurs to be something like distinction. Or I don't know, you know, because that would be the fashion there. Um, I can't help it. Uh, for the longest time there, it felt like I was invisible up there. Because I was breaking the law left and right according to their laws. I was breaking left and right. But they wasn't really doing nothing to me. So um, the part of coming out of extinction uh, feels really great. That uh, part there uh, up there in the museum up there next to the dinosaurs now vacant. But uh, they'll find something else, a prehistoric dinosaur or something put in there. I am not extinct anymore. Any other questions? This guy's full of them, I tell you, just crazy. Okay. He's got a he's got a great part in there. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, I went on with my job. I did the, did different things like. That was going on there. In fact, when we was um, harvesting the game and taking care of it and stuff like that there, and when the officers came in and stuff like that there, because everybody was saying, man, he's going to get arrested and he's going to go to jail. Well, I've been in law enforcement for 23 years as a conservation officer for the Culver Confederated Tribe. Uh, I worked with the conservation officers up there. I knew most of them. And uh, the part that the if they was going to throw me in jail, I could use a vacation. <laughs> there was, uh, you know, and it would have been a paid vacation too, I'm pretty sure, because when we started this whole case thing like that there, we went to the tribal council and said, I'll do it. I'll go up there and go hunt and put my, put my fanny on the line. And I think it was Shirley Charlie who was on, was, was on the tribal council at that time. And, uh, Linda stands up and she says, uh, well, what about Rick if he gets thrown in jail? Who's going to take care of the family? And Shirley, Charlie, she stands up and says, we'll take care of the family. We'll, we'll take care. And Linda says, can I have that in writing? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 
So that part there, uh, it's been a very long journey. And, and the fact that getting to the part to where I got today, where I am at today, is this here and that there. So any other questions? Yes. Did I see any coyotes up there? There's coyotes up there. There's wolves up there. There's pine marns, Canadian lynx. In fact, we just caught the last lynx up there uh, that we were supposed to catch and brought them down here. Uh, it's crazy, too, because we put these collars on, on the, that sends up a signal to the satellite, and then we can track their movement. Yeah, one of the, one of the Canadian lynx that we caught up there in Canada brought it down here, released it down here, it made it home faster than we drove up. <laughs> yes, Robert. The white grizzly? Yes. Yeah. Spirit bears. Yes. You have those. It's just a coloration of, of those there, yes. Questions? All right. I'm going to go home now. A bit of, you've been a beautiful audience. Not too many people went to sleep. Yeah. Kept throwing rocks at you. Yeah. But the interest may find you one day when you think of your family heritage and where you came from and this here and that there. And that'll stir you, hopefully, in a direction that you'll go. Uh, you know, to, to, to find that there's uh, so much in your in your heritage that that brought you brought you to this point in time in your life. Uh, I have that great thing. Yes, Tam. What's that? Are we done? No. How many uh, interviews have you done regarding this case? I know reporters from all over the world have interviewed you. Did you happen to remember kind of a rough Have estimate? a number of people that interviewed me now? How many reporters now? you've been interviewed by? This is the very, very, very first time I've ever had an interview. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Um, I've had a few. Um, the, the part that uh, talking about this case, uh, it's great there that my mother says you can always talk really freely about something that you're really passionate about. And I am very passionate about uh, passing on my heritage hunting to other families. Uh, it's something that I grew up with uh, as starting out as the grouse hunter and then following my brothers around the woods and stuff until they figured I was big and old enough to take care of a deer and then pass me on and let me have the big gun and uh it was kind of it was a cute story about my very first hunt there my brother took took me out it's usually your father will take you out but my father passed on before i was ready and so my brothers took me out hunting and said we're gonna go get your first deer today oh man was excited to i tell you i almost wet my pants uh, so we go over to the neighbors and they, uh, uh, the Halfords, they lend me this 25-35 lever action stuff. And my brother, Tony, he's got a lever action 30-30 and stuff. And they take us up to a place called Ant Mountain. It's up along the uh, Barnaby Creek up in there, over the Angel Limb side over there. Uh, and we're walking around out in the woods out there. And we come to this area. And the next thing you know, uh, two mule deer down below us jump out. And they're just kind of hopping around down below us down there. Uh, my brother, Tony, and I. Uh, live by the adage, more lead in the air means more dangers of hits. And so <laughs> my brothers just kind of st stood back and, and let us go. And we finally did harvest the, the, the animals and stuff. It was kind of cute uh, that we were just kind of blindly shooting. It seemed, it seemed like who, who could get the deer first. <laughs> but that was it. Um, it, it. At that point in time there, it's a family thing that passed on from from generation a generation I, in the court proceedings and stuff like that there explained all of that stuff there that came from being a grouse hunter to a deer hunter to a provider yes
the, the seasons and stuff up there are similar similar to the seasons we have down here that most of it starts up in the early summertime there and then goes on right up to about the end of December um, the game regulations are they're separate their they're, um, regulations are put out uh, the different committees go through and approve them it gets to the council the council approves them and then they, they become the resolution um, so that's a seasonal thing um, different things such as the uh, last year we had a disease called blue tongue that affected a lot of the bighorn sheep and some of the deer population stuff like there so we monitor that there and try to set the game seasons accordingly so we're not over harvesting anything it's kind of nice working with fish and wildlife for the past blankety blank years uh, I did retire at one point but then I got kind of bored after a couple of years and uh, decided to take a seasonal job with fisheries. <laughs> yeah, I, it's kind of nice to go fishery and fishing all day. Same thing I'd have been doing if I wasn't retired. Yeah. Think about it. Fish and wildlife's a great occupation. Any other questions? I'm going to bring some more council people in here and God darn have them talk to you guys. Really put you to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to thank you. I commend you for all the work that you've done on behalf of the Sinaiks people. Thank you for coming to speak with the students and for Native American Heritage Month. I really appreciate you. And Rick is uh, around. If you guys have further questions, feel free to come up. He's very personable, as you could tell. If you're a little shy and don't want to ask questions out loud, feel free to come up and shake hands and meet. You don't care about you yeah. they shake hands. He doesn't care if you shake hands. Yeah, <laughs> sanitizer. Yeah. All right. Well, Native American Heritage Month. We're really appreciative of you coming out and talking about this. This is something that's still going on today. It's not something that just happened historically. We're still, and it'll be up to you. Yeah, it'll be up to you guys. You guys will be doing something next, like the great Rick Dizitel. Thank you. Lem Lemt. <laughs>